And good evening, I'm Jeff Koinange, and this is Jeff Koinange Live. Tonight, a continuation of a discussion we had on Wednesday, State of the Nation. It is important, we have to keep talking, because as I keep saying, the minute we stop talking is the minute we start fighting. So let's sober up, delve into the issues, the real State of the Nation, especially coming after the decisions of this past week. Ololenku, out. Kimayo, out. Ngaiseri, in. Who else? ICC decision as well. Another key component. On the bench today, sitting right next to me, he is ambassador or permanent representative at U UNEP in Gigiri, as well as UNAN. He wears two hats. Ambassador Martin Kimani. And right on the far side, a man who knows his constitution back to front, front to back. Two initials. KK, as in Karanja. Kabage. Gentlemen, good to see you, Ambassador. Thank you. KK, it's a pleasure, as always. Yeah. Anytime. So listen, it's been a momentous <coughs> week. KK, you and I spoke the other day, and you said it was, it's a very momentous week. It's historic, for lack of a better word. Yes. Your, your thoughts? Well, I think this country is going through an incredible transition. Uh, in 2013, we had uh, historical elections. And uh, post that, we had a cabinet, fresh cabinet that was appointed that we have never had before, a professional technocratic cabinet, PACs, who are not in parliament. And uh, the president constituted his team of just 18 cabinet ministers. They've done their job so far, but in the moment that we are looking at, there has been some changes that have taken place. Why did it take so long, KK? I think as a CEO of any country or any company, or even a father of a home, you cannot make decisions just because people are demanding you make decisions. You reflect very carefully and make a decision. When you make that decision, it must be a decision that has had very careful reflection mm. and thought. Yeah. And that is, is, is important for any situation. Belosi, how is this being viewed in diplomatic circles where you sit out there in, uh, in your, um, your lookout point in Gigiri? How are they looking at it? Yeah. Well, Jeff, first, great being here, especially with KK. <laughs> uh, look, I think the interpretation in the diplomatic community is first that Kenya is going through a very rough time from the terrorists uh, and that Kenya is part of a global commons under attack by these same forces. And so when I talk to my counterparts from across the world, one thing they all say is everyone is under one form or the other of attack. There's nothing uniquely Kenyan about this. This is a global issue. It's a regional issue. Uh, so the first thing is that they understand just how difficult Kenya has had it. They also understand uh, the president having to hold a farm line, having to be able to institute strategies from his own vision um, and testing them and changing them as he will. Mm. Um, everyone is in this together. Yeah. Kenya is on the front lines of an immense global war. And with all the rumors, and you know we are a country of rumors, Ambassador, you know this. Um, despite the fact that you all were upgraded to a global headquarters, any talk, we, we hear rumors that UN is going to get up and leave. They're going to go to Kigali. They're going to go to, you know, another country. Can you, can you confirm or, or, or quash that rumor? Listen, I quash this rumor every opportunity I get. Um, Kenya, the UN is not going anywhere. And the reason is Kenya offers them unprecedented advantages. Kenya is the way the world looks. Kenya is where the UN launches its interventions in a region that urgently needs them. Kenya is where we have qualified staff. Kenya is where the Kenyan people decided uh, in the 1970s, in 72, to give the UN from their own property um, this huge asset called the UN compound which is the largest UN compound in the world. The generosity of the Kenyan people to the UN has not been matched by any other developing country, which is why Kenya is the only global headquarters 
of the UN in the global south and in Africa. Mm. I think the UN understands this. Uh, I think every pronouncement we've met with everyone from Ban Ki-moon um, to our partners and all of them believe that Nairobi is the place for the UN to be. Yeah. So I have no fears that the UN is going anywhere. No. no. KK, real quick. Okay, so the easy part was Olelenku out, Kimayo out, Kaisere in as a uh, proposed as the acting CS for internal security. Tough task ahead. I mean, this is not easy. Well, it cannot be easy. Uh, getting into a job that uh, has been in everybody's uh, uh, view is not a simple thing. But looking at his profile, uh, I think he was prepared for this job. And uh, he's not a young man. He's mature, tested. And I believe he'll be able to discharge the mandate as effectively as we can expect him to do. Yeah. But let us not be under any illusion that any one person or any two people can deal with the challenge that is present, uh, presenting itself in this country. And let us also realize one thing. As a country, we have been the most hosp hospitable nation to refugees from Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, Sudan, Somalia, than any other country. Now, that means we have elements in this country that may uh, not necessarily mean well for our country. But because we have taken an international obligation as a country, we must now develop the wherewithal in terms of intelligence, in terms of security, and sometimes uh, that may, done, may be done at the cost or at the expense of human rights. KK, if you were in Kaiseri right now, yeah. what's the first thing you would do? <laughs> Very good uh, question. First thing, you must take stock. Uh, the worst thing anybody can do to, in any job that you may go to is to be rushing. You must sit down and reflect, get to know what is this job all about. Who are these people? Because you see, he requires a team of men and women coming from very different backgrounds that he has to sit down with them. He has to know what is it. And he has also to require um, support from the president, the deputy president, the chief of general staff. He has to require the support of all the technocrats that there is. And above all, Kenyans and also the international community. What we are facing as a country is a problem that has been bred outside of this country. And we are bearing the brunt because of where we are. Now, the second thing I think it needs to do is to consult very widely with his counterpart in Ethiopia, in Tanzania, in Uganda, in Rwanda, in Burundi, we must widen the circle of consultation. Because when we have insecurity in this country, it is insecurity all over this region. And it's a very expensive thing that we cannot even afford. Mm. So he has a big job to do. He has to be a number one diplomat, he has to be a number one security person, and he has to be a number one nationalist, which he is, and he has demonstrated. Yeah. Because that is very, very important, sure. in my opinion. Sure. Yeah. But Lozzi, with insecurity, and, and again, I come back to, to where you sit in your very, um, uh, in your lookout post in Gigiri. Is that a big concern? Obviously, it must be a huge concern among your fellow diplomats. It is a huge concern. But Jeff, I just want to add what, to what KK said. Uh, the first thing is that um, I serve at the pleasure of the president. Um, and my work is to institute strategies and initiatives uh, that the president has one way or another signed off on, whether it's via a cabinet secretary or a permanent secretary. It's about the strategies that I am putting in place. And so the first thing I think Kenyans need to know is that this president has a very strategic view of where he wants to take the country. And on the matter of security, the amount of work that is going into the securing the country is immense. However, the attacks have also come in. Uh, people need to see that one, there's a massive effort to transform the security system. Two, there's a massive effort to transform the economic basis of our national life. And so 
to me, I think when I see the departure of uh, uh, IG Kimayo um, and the coming in of Kayseri, the first thing I will do is to thank these gentlemen for their service. That's the first thing. It's very important because public service is a calling. Public service is a huge sacrifice. Uh, public service is not just driving in a motorcade. It's working from 6 in the morning till 11 and not seeing your family. Yeah. Uh, I believe that the pain Kenyans are feeling over these attacks is a pain that is being felt by this government. It's an anger that's being felt by this government. And we are taking this fight to the enemy. Yeah. Public so service. General Kayseri mm. yes. is going to, I hope, be um, um, vetted positively by parliament. And he's going to bring his immense experience to this mix. But anyway, you look at it, it's a tough task. It's tough. It is. It's security. It is an immensely tough task. It's a huge responsibility. Um, and I'm hoping that that experience and that perspective that he brings um, allows the president more options. Yeah. You, but as you mentioned a moment ago, the fact that, okay, you serve under the, the, the pleasure of the president, and yet this same president who you say has the country's interests at heart is getting slammed every day, especially on social media. Is it because his team, his so-called digital team, aren't doing as good enough a job in counter spinning or what is it because you know you guys are being slammed look jeff we live in a democracy and a democracy is not a chorus of approval by everyone and so kenyans have their opinions kenyans have the right to voice those opinions that's fine um and i think the president would echo that the thing though is that we have an enemy that enemy jeff is has no front lines that enemy is determined to never meet a soldier in the field of battle. They'd rather kill a child. They'd rather go into everyone's home who's watching and murder you, your family, and your friends. That's who we're facing. So even as we criticize and give our views on social media, let us begin by first all seeing this enemy in the clear light of day. This is not an enemy that was created by what Kenya has done or not done. This is an enemy that is global. This is an enemy that, you know, people have been talking about the stripping of women. If this Al-Shabaab had their way, women would never walk these streets without a man with them. Women would not drive. Women would be stoned. Mm. That's their vision, right? Yeah. And so let us be angry at the things we need to be angry at. But the most important thing is that Kenyans right now need to know that this enemy is not the enemy of President Uhuru Kenyatta, is not the enemy of Jubilee. It's an enemy of every Kenyan. Mm. And I think what the president was trying to say the other day, uh, when he gave his uh, a number of speeches, he said very clearly, it's time for us to all look and say, what role am I going to play in this fight? Not because we are supposed to all lift guns and go fight, but because we are all supposed to come together and reject the vision of al-Shabaab, yeah. reject the idea that our country is being blamed for their murder of our innocent brothers and sisters. KK, criticism against the president. Is it undue? Is it unfair? <clears throat> I think one of the, uh, the complex and very painful lessons the Kenyans must realize is that um, what we are dealing with is a 30-year-old process. We have been having a very slow but sure way of radicalizing the youth. Uh, uh, 30 years ago, how old was the president? Uh, 53 minus 30, 23. 23. He didn't even have the thought that he could ever be the president of this country. And same thing about Ruto. Now, when I look at the political outbursts saying that uh, the president has failed, this has happened, that has happened, I always wonder, if you look at the international journals on security, if you look at the international journals on terrorism, if you look at the international journals on radicalization, you realize Kenyans are not grappling with the true reality. What we are dealing with here happened in the 1990s, 1980s, 
1990s, 2000, that's over 30 years. So we must lack on with one reality, that what we are dealing with right now is not going to be fixed tomorrow. Kenyans must be prepared for the long haul. Why do I say that? And I would like to recommend to a number of Kenyans. There are three books I like to recommend to them. Mm. There's a book called Infidel. Mm -hmm. There's another book called The Caged Virgin. And the third book called The Nomads. These books have been written by a lady by the name of Ayan Hasi Ali who was a member of parliament in the Netherlands right. and currently she lives in the US. She works for American Enterprise Institute. This lady did her primary school in Kenya and she went to Muslim girls secondary school. So I can relate with her very well. I would like them to read those three books and particularly the, the the security agencies of this country. When they read those three books, they will realize what we are dealing with is a seed that has been planted over 30 years period mm. and more. And it's coming to, it's coming to fruition now. And now, <clears throat> when you start talking about one person being able to deal with this particular issue, I think we are under very serious illusion, mm -hmm. if not delu delusion. Mm -hmm. And I like Kenyans to understand this is not something that is simple. Why do I say that? Now, I heard the president say something yesterday, but I like to say this. There are three doctrines as far as Islam is concerned. There's a social doctrine that deals with the issue of women. There is what they call the religious doctrine that deals with the issue of prayers, giving uh, uh, alms, and so forth and so forth. And there is a third issue called the political, the fundamentalist, and the jihadist issue. That political aspect of Islam is something that people need to interrogate very, very seriously. Mm. Because the mainstream Muslims, they are the best people you can deal with. Until now, you start confronting yourself with the doctrine of politics, fundamentalism, and jihadism. Gentlemen, I want to take a break there and come back and talk about the Mandera attacks. There's some people who are saying that those were not Al-Shabaab. Maybe it's inter-clan fighting and they're just taking advantage of the situation. 66 people killed in two weeks, KK. I mean, Ambassador, it's ridiculous. And we have troops in the area. Why? What's, what's going on? Or is it the po regular police and administrative police who are in conflict? Let's find out. First, we'll take a break. Chef Kananga live coming to you from La Pruña Doro restaurant at the Intercontinental Hotel. We are taking a critical look at the state of the nation going forward. It's been an historic week. We need to keep interrogating it. Don't even think of touching that remote control. JKL will be back in 